Well, good morning. Uh, my name's Tom Franklin, and for the last 13 years, I've been the RUF campus minister at Birmingham Southern College. And uh, God has been doing some exciting things to allow uh, me to leave that job and start to plant a church in Homewood. And uh, I'll be able to tell you more about that as the summer goes on uh, when Bob returns and we can talk about it together. But that sort of... Uh, What's up with me? But uh, like I said, I've, I've been the RUF campus minister for 13 years. Maybe more significantly, though, for the last 20 years, I've sat out there. So for more than 20 years, I have listened to Bob preach. That's a lot of Walt's sermons. <laughs> uh, and so what I thought was, uh, it's also a lot of movie clips, um, in honor of him not being here, and asking me to preach, I thought I would start off this morning with my own uh, top 10 list of my own top 10 uh, favorite Bobisms. <laughs> and uh, some of you will get a kick out of some of these. Um, all right, top 10 sayings that I've heard from Bob over the years. And I have to start with number one the gospel waltz, repent, believe, fight. Number two, the gospel pipeline. Where did that go? Number three, further up and further in. I went to the vault for this one. Number four, peace aggle. The seven deadly sins, peace aggle. Number five, cheer up, you're a lot worse than you think. <laughs> Number six and seven are two of my favorite sermon titles that I've ever heard Bob preach. Number six is ready, fire, aim. And number seven is don't just do something, sit there. Number eight, Bobby Flay in the Gospel Way. <laughs> you remember the Velcro suit? Sadly, I do too. <laughs> number nine, I'll never forget when Bob preached through the book of Amos. And he started off the book of Amos by saying, the reason why we're going to study Amos is because what if we bump into Amos in heaven? And he says, hey, did you read my book? And number 10, my absolute favorite, we heard it 52 times to be exact in 2017. Welcome to Oak Mountain Presbyterian Church. Did you know that as a church, we're going through a devotional called the Blue Book? <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, there is no other voice for me that's been more foundational in how I understand the Bible and how I understand the Christian life than Bob Flayhart, and like you, I'm happy he's getting time away, and I'm ready for him to be back. Um, so if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn it to Matthew chapter 4. That's not me on the slide, just so you know. Um, Matthew chapter 4 is what we're going to be looking at, and as you're turning there, this may come uh, as a surprise to some of you, but I got in trouble a lot when I was a kid. Uh, in school, I did the normal things like trip the teacher as he was lecturing, you know, in the hall, um, maybe hit a kid over the head with my gym clothes, the usual things. Uh, but one thing in particular, one story I remember was in fourth grade. I don't know about you uh, at your elementary school, but at my elementary school, we had these ladies called hall monitors. And it was their job to make sure that no one was in the hall, that no one was being loud, that no one was shooting spitballs on anybody else, that everybody was in order. And basically, I think their job was to make sure elementary school was not fun. <laughs> and we had this one particularly mean hall monitor. I'm just going to call her Miss Smith. That wasn't her name. But Miss Smith um, came roaring down the hall one day. And she stood in our classroom door and said, I could hear you from the other side of the school. And she begins to lecture our class. Well, my desk was uh, kind of right in front of the doorway where she was. And so I had my back to Mrs. Smith. And as she began to lecture us, I began to mimic her. <laughs> and I just didn't think it through. <laughs> because then, all of a sudden, everyone in the class started laughing. And Miss Smith knew exactly what was happening. And so she grabbed me by the arm. She pulled me out into the hall. And for a brief moment, I was face to face 
with the enemy. (laughs) Now, I told you that because in this chapter that we're about to look at, Jesus is face to face with the enemy. And not just a person, a hall monitor, but the ultimate enemy, the devil. Um, I actually preached this this sermon in a series this past spring at Birmingham Southern as a larger series called Encounters with Jesus, where every week I took a different encounter in the Gospels, and this one in particular was not an encounter with a person, but an encounter with the devil. So if you have a Bible open, I invite you to look along with, uh, with me at Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to le- read verses 1 through 11, and I invite you to stand in honor of God's word as we read. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, He was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is God's word. You can have a seat. So there are three temptations in this passage that we're going to look at this morning. And we're going to look not only at the temptation, but how Jesus responds. But there's one thing we have to look at before we look, dive into the temptations, and it's this. Just before Matthew chapter 4 is Matthew chapter 3. And do you know that in the original uh, manuscripts, they did not have numbers in chapter divisions? And so it is worth noting the context of Matthew 4 and what comes right before it. And if you notice, if you have your Bible open, that come right before Matthew 4 is the baptism of Jesus. This coronation day where where this voice from heaven booms as Jesus is being baptized. This is my son whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. You have this voice that everyone can hear booming from heaven. This is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Mark's gospel even says that immediately after those words were said, Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted. Now watch what happens. The first temptation, verse two. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, understatement. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, most commentators, when they look at this, they point out that that Satan is tempting Jesus with something good, food. That most temptations are something good that we are tempted either at the wrong time or in the wrong way. And I think that that's true and helpful. But what I think is more interesting underneath that is that what the devil is saying to Jesus is this. If you are the son of God, why are you hungry? You're the son of God. Why is God allowing you to be hungry? He must not love you. He must not want the best for you. He must not be for you because you're hungry And do you know that this is the devil's oldest trick in the book? 
all the way back in Genesis chapter three, what was it that the serpent tempted Adam and Eve with? Sure, it was the fruit, but do you remember what he said? Underneath it all, what he said was, God doesn't want the best for you. He's holding out on you. He must not love you. He must not want the best for you. And so here in Matthew 4, what Satan really is saying to Jesus is, why are you hungry? If you're the son of God, God must not love you. Now, what did I just say happened right before Matthew 4? This voice boomed from heaven. This is my son whom I love. And immediately Satan goes to work. Immediately the voices start. God doesn't love you. God doesn't want the best for you. He must not be pleased with you. And watch what Jesus says. Verse four, Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, what is significant about this? It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Well, first thing he's doing is he's quoting scripture. When Jesus says, it is written, you know that that means he's quoting some, somewhere else in the Bible. So what Jesus is doing is, is that he's quoting Deuteronomy 8, and he is fighting against temptation with scripture. And at some level, we have to see that Jesus is teaching us to do the same thing. So if you're like me, and there are moments during the day, during the hour, during the week, where you are tempted, what Jesus wants us to hear this morning is, use scripture to battle against temptation. But the only way we're gonna be able to use scripture to battle against temptation is to know scripture. And I don't know if you're like me, but how many times have you set out in the beginning of a year to say, I'm gonna know more scripture this year? The only way we're gonna know more scripture as a church is if we memorize scripture. And I have found that personally, the only way I know how to memorize scripture is to do it with other people. May we be a church that memorizes scripture, not to make us smarter, but so that we can fight against temptation. But there's more to what Jesus is doing. When Jesus says, it is written, man does not need bread alone, he is admitting that we need bread. He says man does not live on bread alone. He knows we need bread. But you know what he's probably saying? He's saying, in the same way that you and I need bread, we need words. Man needs bread to live, and we also need words. We need the words spoken to us I love you. I'm well pleased with you. You are enough. You have what it takes. And so Jesus turns it back on the devil and says, you know what? My father has spoken. And I choose to live on the words that my father has spoken. And we all know this intuitively. We all know that we need words in order to live. I still remember where I was in the fall of 1993 in the weight room when Coach Ron Schrader told me that he was going to find a spot for me on the team next year. I still remember exactly where I was standing when I threw the power clean bench down and he said, Franklin, we're going to find a spot for you on the team next year. I'll never forget it because we need words. We need to know that someone loves us. I'll never forget on August 12, 2006, when Kristen stood across from me and said, I love you, not just today, but I choose to love you every day. We need words spoken over us. And this is not a motivational speech. This is not Oprah. This is how God made you and me. We are hardwired as human beings to need words spoken over us. And without them, we cannot live. And the amazing thing is, is that what is true about Jesus, if you are a Christian, is now true about you. 
And the very same words that are spoken to Jesus in Matthew 3 are now true of you if you're a Christian, because you are united to Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. So you and I need, in the same way we need bread, we need words. Let's keep going. Temptation number two. Then the devil, verse five, took him to the holy city and he had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself off this building. Now that does not sound like a temptation, right? But watch what he does. Throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot. What the devil is doing is he is using our strength against us. The devil knows that he cannot win against scripture, right? And so rather than fight head on head against scripture, what he will do is, is that he will get us to twist scripture to make it say what we want it to say. Now, I don't know anything about martial arts, so I'm not even going to pretend to be wise in this area. But I did read this week that there is a move in martial arts where rather than opposing the force of an opponent's blow, you actually absorb it and use their force and their momentum against them. I think it's in jujitsu. Someone tell me afterwards if that's true. Nonetheless, rather than, than block the opponent's force or energy, you use their force or energy against them. And that's exactly what the devil is doing right here. Because if he cannot win against the Bible, he will get us to use the Bible and use it against us. Now, how does he do it? Because he quotes this verse, he will not let you get hurt. Angels will protect you. And so you see the twist? If angels will protect you, then you can throw yourself off this building because no harm will come to you. And that's not what the Bible says. And there are so many ways that you and I do this. We take what the Bible says and we twist it to say what we want it to say. And it's rarely things like, oh, I can throw myself off a building. But what about this one? If there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, I can throw myself into sin. Or what about this one? If God promises to be with me when I open my Bible and read it, then that must mean I'm going to have a really good day today. Or God prom promises to bless us if we give. Well, if I give, then that must mean that God's going to bless me with X, Y, or Z this year. You see what the devil does? He gets us. If he can't win against us, he will use the scripture and twist it. And Jesus responds, it is also written. So you see this interplay here between Jesus and the devil. And you have to see, our enemy knows the Bible. Our enemy just quoted scripture. And Jesus uses scripture again and says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. It's pretty obvious what Jesus is saying. Just because it says, I will not let harm come to you does not mean that you can presume upon my care and do whatever you want. Just because God's grace is radical and amazing does not mean, therefore, that you can throw yourself into obedience and say, hey, God's grace is real. Just because God promises that when we engage in the spiritual disciplines that we will be blessed because they are a means of grace does not mean that X, Y, and Z are going to happen. And aren't we tempted to think that? Most of the world is watching soccer right now, but some of us watch the College World Series because we still like the game of baseball. Do you know that baseball players are the most superstitious of all athletes? It's ridiculous. If, I'm, if we're losing a game and I'm eating a banana and all of a sudden we come back and win that game, then by all means, we should get a banana for every game from here on out because, and just put the banana on our head because that will help us win a game. But we do it. 
I put my hat on every time I went out to pitch the same way. I warmed up every time the same way. I jumped over the line every time the same way. I cleared the dirt off the rubber every time the same way. And it's the same way with my spiritual life. If I do this, 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 and this, then that means it's going to be a success. And that is twisting scripture. And Jesus says, do not put God to the test. Last temptation, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And this is what he says. All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Now, what's he saying? I think the gloves are coming off at this point. I think he's dropping the act. And I think now we see what the devil was up to all along. All he wanted was for Jesus to worship something other than God. All the devil wants for us is that, is that we would worship something other than God. And for all the silliness in our culture when it comes to the devil, the sort of red dragon fire breathing that, you know, that makes people skeptical and not believe in the devil... Is it not true that every depiction of evil in film and in literature is just like this? It starts off with this glittery offer of something beautiful, and then all of a sudden we need a little bit more of it, and we become more and more enamored by it, and then all of a sudden we're kind of stuck, but we can't go anywhere else, and then eventually, guess what? We're enslaved. And this is the way addictions work, right? We need a little bit more and a little bit more. That is what the devil has always wanted for you and for me, is that we would begin to become enamored with something, usually a good thing, and need it just a little bit more and just a little bit more until eventually we are enslaved. And Jesus responds with probably the most important verse for us this morning, and it's verse 10. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then it says the devil left him. Now, why is Jesus saying this? Because Jesus wants us to know that we are worshiping creatures. It's not a question of, of if we will worship. It's just a matter of who or what we will worship, because that's how God made us. I hope you are familiar with this, but if you're not, uh, an American writer named David Foster Wallace probably delivered the most uh, famous commencement address at Kenyon College not too long ago. And in this commencement speech, he said this. Here's something that's true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Wallace goes on to say, if you worship money, if that's where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Is that not true? Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, and you will feel weak and afraid, and you will need more power over others to keep that fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid. A fraud, always on the verge of being found out. What Jesus is trying to say to us this morning is that you were made to worship something. And worshiping God is the only way to make life work. Everything else we choose to worship is only a God substitute. And it will always overpromise and underdeliver. Because whatever it is that you and I choose to worship, whether it be success or popularity or our kids, or our work, or money, or power, or pleasure, or comfort, or ease, whatever it is, 
It will let us down because it was never meant to give us what we ultimately want. Only God, our creator, can do that. And so Jesus says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, why did I pick Matthew 4? It's kind of random for us to just sort of jump into this passage. Why, why this passage this morning? The reason why I picked this passage is because I am tempted every day and I fail. The reason why I picked this passage is because I believe the lie every day that God does not love me and that he is not for me and that he does not want what's best for me. Every day I believe that lie. The reason why I picked this passage is because I am so tempted to take the Bible and twist it into something that I want it to say. I preach this passage because my heart is an idol-making factory. I churn out a different idol every day, whether it's my children, whether it's comfort and ease, whether it's your approval, I can come up with any list of God's substitutes. And I needed this passage because I needed to see Jesus face temptation and win. In the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 5, it talks about Jesus as the second Adam. It says that in... In Genesis 1, the first Adam was tempted by the devil and failed. But in Matthew chapter 4, the second Adam was tempted by the devil and won. And I need to know that Jesus is my champion. I do not need a moral example to follow, I need a champion. The Bible says that in our birth, in our first birth, we are united to the first Adam. And all that gets us is sin and misery. But the Bible also says that in our second birth, this is why Christians say we are born again. In our second birth, guess what? We are united to the second Adam. And the Bible says that when we are united to the first Adam... We are born sinners, and we bring nothing to the table. But because we are united to the second Adam, everything that is true about Jesus now becomes true about me. This is why Christianity is good news and not just good advice. Because to be a Christian is to be united to a champion. To be a Christian is to be united to someone who faced temptation and won and we need to know because we are failures. The only thing we contribute is sin and misery and maybe weak mustard seeds of faith. But guess what? Jesus lived a perfect life and died a perfect substitutionary death for you and then rose from the dead. And do you know that we bring nothing to the table, but he gives us everything. There's some sports fans in this room, but I don't know how many in he, people in here know who Dickie Simpkins is. Anybody know who Dickie Simpkins was? So Dickie Simpkins played in the NBA back in the 90s. Do you know that Dickie Simpkins has three NBA championship rings? That's the same number of rings as LeBron and no one in here has heard of him. Dickie Simpkins played basketball for the Chicago Bulls back in the 90s. He played with Jordan, Pippen, Rodman. Do you know that in the, in, the, in the Bulls championship runs back in the 90s, do you know how many points Dickie Simpkins scored? Zero. Do you know how many assists Dickie Simpkins had? Zero. Do you know how many minutes Dickie Simpkins played? Zero. But guess what? He got the same ring. 
And he got the same parade. The same cheers were yelled at him that were for Michael Jordan. And he didn't contribute a thing. And that's why we need Matthew 4. Because we don't contribute a thing. And yet, if we are united to Jesus, what is said about him is now said about us. And what he gets, we get. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, if we could only believe that this is true, how it might change our lives. To consider the good news that though we are weak and feeble and broken, we are united to one who was perfect. And God, when you said to your son, this is my son whom I loved, those words are now spoken to us. May we believe that that is true. Thank you for your word and how it encourages our hearts this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.